So you can see my presentation, right? Yeah. yeah that's good. So as I said before, I'll uh, talk about two topics actually, the real life, life of a data analyst from my perspective and uh, my little research in gender gap in Kazakh pages uh, that I analyzed using art. Uh, so first of all, thanks for coming everyone. And I'm Vera and I'm from Kazakhstan. I was living in Tbilisi for four months last four months, yeah. Uh, and I have uh, four years of experience as data analyst at post office, uh, telecom bank classified and product studio. So I have diversified experience, I would say. Uh, now I work as product data analyst at Railsware and also I'm mentoring students uh, at online course from Yandex Practicum. Yeah, I think that's uh, in summary my background and why uh, I'm sharing my experience in terms of tools and tasks because I have broader knowledge in different fields. Yeah. Well, well, we can uh, make friends on LinkedIn if you, if you wish or if you have any questions. Also, we have opening at Trailsphere as data analyst. So if you're interested, you can apply. Um, so data analyst toolkit. I, I wanted to start with example tasks that I solve at work. So the first one, and I think it's the most interesting one, answering questions why. So why are we, why are clients leaving us? Why don't we make sales as we, as we wanted? Or why, um, why everything is wrong or why everything is good? We don't understand why people are coming in buying our products or what is exciting about our products. Uh, it's a very broad, quite a broad question and you should use all your expertise, experience and your imagination and your detective skills to answer that. Uh, also, another task is getting some data. For example, um, we want to know about our competitive market. We want to know how are they doing, what uh, amount of users they have and stuff. So it, can be that kind of data, it can be data that, for example, we are sending letters, uh, for example, greetings letters, some, um, uh, I don't know, articles uh, and stuff, and we want to import that statistics to one place and analyze it, for example, for example in our database. It's also uh, that kind of uh, job, and automate something uh, actually is from the second one, so you want to not just manually import for one time, but you want to automate it and get that data, for example, on daily basis, on, on hourly basis, or maybe you want to get some notifications when something is going wrong, or uh, when, or you just want to know every day um, average statistical statistics on your service, for example, revenue, active base, uh, and stuff. Also, another task is data monitoring, so you are looking uh, and the, at the data and you're um, seeing if everything is up to date, everything is correct, everything is just uh, ready to work with. Also, uh, the, main, the main part of your job is to explain your findings. For example, you analyze something, this question why, and uh, it's one part of the job to just analyze it. And the second step, uh, is to explain it, to share your knowledge uh, that way that everybody will understand it. Also, the exciting part of our job is to learn something new every day because the field is developing every day. Also, the tools that we are using, there are a lot of them and every day there is a new one. For example, to visualize data, there are some BI tools every day, there is something new, something maybe more convenient, more powerful and stuff. And uh, also, uh, R itself has uh, many libraries that you are that you can explore. I don't know every day maybe a new library for you. Yeah. And the uh, the last part is collaborate, collaborate with your team, collaborate with other data analysts, because uh, most of your job uh, you are not just independent worker who has some knowledge and. Uh, tasks in your head and you're just doing it you every time it's collaborating for example you share your findings and then your colleague asks um, maybe we should explore more this way or these clients or i have another question about that and also when you're collaborating with your data analyst colleagues or engineers you may ask them how to do this task for example do you have expertise in this or that maybe we can work uh, better together 
and share approaches with, with each other. So um, toolkit, what, what kind of tools I use every day? So um, everything I start with SQL because uh, all of our data, all of our all the data that we need is in our database. So I do data extraction, data preparation, data monitoring. So it's the first uh, window for, for me. So I, I write SQL queries and get the data in the in that type of view that I need. Then when I got the data, I need to prepare it. Uh, for that, I usually use Air Python plus Google Colab or Twitter Notebook. Uh, uh, so the two are in Python just languages and uh, Google Lab Notebook is a very good, useful way to present your findings. So I can share them uh, with my colleagues and it's easy to collaborate, uh, especially in Google Colab, they have like interactive forms where uh, maybe your coworker can put some data, for example, filters for your data or some, I don't know, API token if it's some external data that is used and can collaborate with your Jupyter Notebook very easily. So what I do in those tools, it's exploratory data analysis, so actually answering this question why. Um, uh, also one-time deep records, uh, especially including text analytics. Um, why uh, I, um, I said about text analytics, because uh, I try mostly prepare that data, the most of it using SQL, uh, it's usually enough for efforts uh, in some BI tools to just select stuff, uh, some data processing, not very extensive, and also adding filters, so, uh, usually it's enough. But when you need uh, deep analysis and including that advanced techniques like text uh, analytics, it's usually not possible doing it uh, in SQL. Uh, that's why you use code. We had previously a couple of webinars on that topic, and R is a good tool to use for this kind of stuff. And also, uh, I use R and Python for API integrations and crawling, uh, so getting data from somewhere. Uh, uh, example that I said before, for example, compet competitors or mailing, sending service and stuff. Um, and also, yeah, API integrations, I also can get the data and send data to it. For example, I want to refresh information about our clients uh, using R. Yeah, I connect to that API, I grab data from our database and send it uh, out there on that API. Uh, also, I use dashboards, data visualization for um, reports for building reports that everyone can access and see how we're growing as a product, what are our problems, what are our errors on the app, for example. And there are some examples of tools that I use. So there is nice uh, library uh, called Flex Dashboard. So you can build dashboards in R. It would be uh, interactive. You can build it with tabs. It's a very good tool, especially if, uh, for example, your business don't have money on some fancy products like Tableau or Power BI because they cost money. Uh, you can use Flex dashboards, very nice. Uh, um, the second one is Dash. It's a, an alternative on Python. So if you use Python, you can use Dash. It's also free. Also, Google has product Data Studio. It's free and it's uh, it's easy to use uh, when you have your data in Google Spreadsheets or uh, Google BigQuery because it's all Google ecosystem and also the tool is free. So, and you can build in it some simple, uh, simple dashboards or bar charts, pie charts and stuff, so really usual one. If you need some advanced uh, charts, uh, Data Studio, uh, yet not a uh, way to go. And also you can use Power BI or Tableau. Uh, they are they cost money and they are not very cheap, but um, I not worked. Uh, I haven't worked with Power BI a lot, but I worked with Tableau for a year, and it's very powerful tool. You can build a lot of stuff using it. Also, uh, they have big community sharing some life hacks how to build this kind of chart that's not built in from the box. Yeah, it's you can build pretty much everything using it. And also, Pablo has uh, integration with Python and R. So, uh, in theory, you can build some data preparation using those languages and just put them in your Tableau 
uh, what's uh, the next one, the next part of the toolkit is automation. So I talked about the task of automate stuff. And uh, for example, when you want to uh, do something, you wrote R or Python code and you want to work this code every hour or every day or every week, maybe. Um, for that, uh, there are some ways to go. For example, there is Google Apps Scripts. They are and those are scripts that, uh, that works based on Google products like, like Google Spreadsheets, Google Docs, Google Calendar and, and stuff. Um, my case was using it uh, with Google Spreadsheets. So I have data in Google Spreadsheets and I want, uh, want to use something, for example, uh, to send this data to another API to refresh our user's data. And Google Apps Script is based on JavaScript. Um, yeah, and with this, with their own functions, for example, getting that data from spreadsheets, they are built in. Uh, and uh, we went with this solution because uh, it's free, actually. They have some kind of quota, but uh, on the start, you can use it and don't pay money. And also, uh, another um, positive point about Google Apps Script, you don't have to support this uh, ecosystem, your program, your server, your cloud, or something like that. You just wrote the script and it's Google's part to support it. Also, there are Google uh, Cloud Functions uh, where you can write on Python or JavaScript, I think. There is also R. Uh, they are also from Google, but they are more, uh, they are based on cloud and they are more powerful and so you pay for them for amount of uh, memory they are, they are using and stuff. Uh, also, we use Terraform and Clasp. So these are tools to connect. Terraform is connecting to uh, Google ecosystem like BigQuery and uh, Google Cloud Functions. And uh, Clasp is about Google Apps Script. So how we use them? We use those both tools. Uh, with GitHub Actions, uh, what it, does it mean? So uh, you have your GitHub, GitHub repository with your, um, for example, SQL queries and you commit changes on those queries. For example, you have a data view where you prepare, prepare data for some, uh, for some report, for example. And after a discussion with your boss, you uh, wanted to change some filters for it, want to tune something, and you made those changes and then you commit to GitHub. And using GitHub Actions with those tools, those changes immediately go to production, to the query, for example. That way you have version history. So there won't be a situation like somebody changed something and uh, another person didn't know that and suddenly they have different numbers and don't know why. And also if you have some mistakes on your code, you will easily restore the previous version, version and, and uh, GitHub also, as I said, we use it for version control for uh, and for deployment uh, with GitHub Actions, as I said. Yeah, uh, it was, was the first part of the talk. And uh, there's uh, a question. Okay, um, so the first one was, uh, which file formats do the different dashboards take in? Are all of them integratable with R? Uh, I think you can return to the slides, it would be easier. Um, so in uh, Flex dashboard and dash, they are on Python and R. Uh, and I think it would be any format of the data they can take in because you the first step is to load it using R or Python. Flex dashboard is working with R, it's a library. Um, and so you can connect to database, you can connect to API or just import CC file, Excel file, and what you wish. The same with dash. Data Studio has different connectors. Um, they don't work with R or Python. Um, they, they can work with databases like Google BigQuery, um, MySQL, as if I'm correct. Um, they have trailer integration. So they have uh, a lot of integration, but I don't believe that they have some co coding uh, integrated in yet. At least. Uh, Power BI and Tableau. About Tableau, 
um, our team at my previous company, they made successful integration with R and Python. So there is a possibility to code and then build a dashboard. And also they, um, those tools have a lot of integrations to database, to Google Analytics, to, uh, I don't know, just a lot of tools, um, Excel, Google Sheets, uh, just CSV files and stuff. They both have pages uh, where they list the integrations. Um, so uh, those two um, possibly uh, have all the connections that you want and that you need. So can I ask here, um, is it then you, you mostly use them for data visualization, these different dashboards, and um, you don't do it then in R or, or other program, you would rather do them with these dashboards? Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, I use them for reports. For example, if I want uh, to build a report that everyone, everybody can access and it will be online, I use those tools. In Flex Dashboard, if you're using this library, you can set up a server or some cloud where you put it, like Shiny App, and give a link to your colleagues uh, and everybody will just look at it and you have some schedule to, for data to refresh, for example. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, Power BI and Tableau and Data Studio, they're already on the server, so they're already online and they just connect to your data themselves. And, and if you connect, for example, to database, database is updated on your schedule somehow, it's on your part. And then the Data Studio, for example, just grabs uh, your data every day. And if you need just uh, fresh data, you click uh, refresh, Page refresh data, and you have the last uh, data only there. Yeah. And uh, for data visualization itself, if it's like one time report, uh, some deep research, for example, I would normally use uh, R uh, in Jupyter Notebook configuration. So, because uh, that way I don't need the data to be online, to be accessible by everyone, to be accessible by link. I just have this tool and show and discuss and collaborate with my colleagues and then maybe we can decide to build a dashboard out of it. Maybe not. Maybe we just got answers for our question and I save, save this notebook in our shared folder and we can just refresh it when we need. And about GitHub Actions, uh, they are not free as if I'm correct. Uh, we got them, we, so in our company we have some corporate plan, paid plan, uh, yeah, and they're not free. Uh, I, I'm not sure technically how does it work uh, because uh, I used help to build uh, those apps that refresh data, refresh our code uh, on production. Um, but I believe there is some uh, know, server that read your code and do stuff as you wrote it. Yeah, in more simple language, as I understand it. Because um, it actually works, you change something in GitHub and then you see in seconds on production that everything is changed. It's uh, using API, actually, of those instruments that uh, use. Are there any other questions? If no, uh, we can move on. Um, so another part of my talk was to how to analyze public data and stay objective. Um, so my goal was to analyze um, data from different sources to understand this uh, gap between salaries. So uh, why I even started this kind of research, I uh, started with an article about uh, uh, cruelty at home with women and the second part was about paying and why did I even start that because uh, when we talk about feminism issues for example in Kazakhstan even with my friends uh, um, they always say that now everything is equal you can be president you can uh, work you can I don't know do everything that men can do as well uh, yeah and it's hard to argue because they are just uh, can, um, they're just confident and they are right and it's no point to, to discuss yeah and i wanted to be more objective and use some numbers and understand using them as data analysts if everything is okay yeah. 
And um, one of the questions was how big is, this, is the pay gap between men and women in Kazakhstan and why is it happening? And my first data source was uh, public data from statistics department in Kazakhstan. And there are some links, uh, and also article on Medium, uh, it's in Russian. Um, yeah, and there is some useful quote. Also, this uh, work was very boosting for my skills because I learned a lot while doing it because I analyzed some dirty data from uh, statistics. It's, it wasn't dirty in terms of quality of data, but it was in uh, Microsoft Word. It's not a usual resource to use to get data. Uh, and you can use uh, this, this library docs, doc structure. Uh, yeah. And what it does, it's uh, reading your document and it gets all the tables from it. Uh, at first, it re it's reading your document and this function is to extract tables from it. And uh, for example, I use the salary doc with salaries, and I, for this with this code, I am getting a seven T's table <laughs> from this uh, document. Uh, it's it wasn't easy to get this number, and I didn't have any idea how to automate this calculation. But I uh, just put numbers that I thought were correct, and then I found this table. You can actually open your document and read uh, and count your tables, and then the, the table you need, for example, is number 70. Does the docs file have to be in our environment for the docs structure to work? You just put it in any folder that you want and just read a path uh, to it. As usual, CSV file, it, it works like that. Uh, also, I wanted to show. Uh, I wanted to show some data preparation tricks that I used. Um, so uh, there was a very useful mutate, mutate add function. So you have uh, you are grabbing uh, every uh, column that contains men, men and women, and apply some function. To it. For, for example, salary to number, uh, I forgot to put it here. It, I built a function that uh, gets uh, salary in a text because they used format more readable by everyone. They used spaces between thousands, for example, or uh, some uh, commas uh, instead of dots. So there was like data processing function. Um, also, everything. Uh, is very useful it, that way you uh, select for example a field that you want to, want to be first for example field in Russian that I created here and every other column is in the same order that was before. Um, uh, uh, be before that I wrote, uh, wrote down every column uh, by comma and, and it was very convenient. Uh, also I like very much gazer function that way you pivot data uh, because it was in pivot format uh, at first and also a very useful function is recode function uh, because for uh, my article and charts i want that uh, it be more readable more beautiful that's why i changed names to more readable ones and also uh, i used reorder function uh, it's to uh, take your uh, factor, for example, sex here, men and women, and order it ba based by some numeric column, for example, salary. So that way, the first one uh, will be uh, the sex with the lowest salary, and the second one will be with the highest salary. You can order it in descending or ascending order. Here is ascending order. Um, also, I learned how to add some icons uh, to. Uh, to charts, I will show on the second slide on the next slide how it looks like. Uh, so actually, you can uh, it's the last three lines. Uh, you use annotation custom and put uh, prepared icons in this way, and you just uh, tell which position you want it, want them to be in. It's for that you use y min y max uh, x min x max. Yeah, and that's it actually. And that way you receive uh, columns on bar chart. I wanted to be uh, the chart to 
be more readable and more interactive so it won't be boring that why that's why i used icons for the chart and those are average salaries in our country in kazakhstan in 2019 so it's about uh, $200 for men and uh, $300 for women. Uh, uh, currency in Kazakhstan India. Yeah. Uh, so I received in my research, not only by this graph, I analyzed some um, salaries between industries, uh, years and stuff. And the, on the 2019, we have 32% pay gap. Uh, and the question is why? Because again, I have this argument that you, it's just your fault. Uh, you are just not asking enough money and stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, and the question was actually, do women ask for less money? And I decided to analyze some. So uh, for job, we use this Headhunter platform. Uh, it's a Russian platform, but it's also popular in Kazakhstan. Uh, for example, if you want to find job in tech industry, you will use Headhunter mostly. Uh, and uh, they also they have CVs published, so I can publish my CV and uh, put down desired uh, salary. There. And the idea was to grab uh, those CVs by titles, uh, title equals job, and compare uh, the ranges between men and women. Uh, so. Uh, and the result was, for example, in financial field, uh, the blue color is for men. You, you see that a blue color is asking for more money uh, than women. We had more women with uh, less asking money, if I can say that. Uh, but here it's not so dramatical because um, it's also um, agrees with public data from statistics uh, department. I think because the field is more traditional and maybe uh, people already aware of uh, salaries, average salaries, they know what to ask for. But still, uh, the gap exists also from uh, the side that people put lower uh, salaries in their resumes. Yeah, in CVs, you can put desired salary yourself. So I, I want to be, for example, a data analyst and I uh, want to work, for example, $1,000 a month. Uh, it helps, for example, um, potential em employers to see that kind of uh, price, kind of wage, and maybe they will think, no, I, we don't have enough budget for that. Um, I, uh, I don't remember actually how many of them didn't have such that, but actually uh, most of CVs don't have much data, um, salary data. But uh, in financials, I had more than 100 for each gender, so uh, that's why I put them in the graph. Because uh, my was interest was about data analysts, but there wasn't enough data to rely on. Uh, it was like 30 resumes and uh, very different salaries, yeah. yeah. And here, uh, because again, it's more in a traditional industry, and we have more people in, in it. And uh, also, search. I also search, search for front end developers. Uh, I asked my friends what kind of jobs can I look for, so there would be more people to compare. Uh, yeah, and again, for front end developers, we see. Um, I uh, peak for uh, pink graph. Uh, all, the reason also can be that uh, girls are on average less experienced. For example, maybe they are all juniors, and that's that's why I'm asking for less uh, money. For example, but still uh, there is a gap. So people asking uh, less money actually. Even if you uh, look at the tail, where uh, those are actually good salaries uh, like a thousand dollars and more um, or hundred thousand is uh, one thousand dollar dollars um, and still we have more men than women asking for that kind of money um, and based on those charts i know that's not a lot a lot of data and also it's only from one resource and also for 
to uh, jobs. Uh, but I just wanted to check some uh, this idea. Uh, and uh, so based on these statistics, yeah, women tend to ask less money. Uh, but again, why we do that is another deep question. So why we underprice ourselves, why those people underprice their, themselves. And actually, it, I had those kind of situations at work uh, from my personal experience that I didn't know how to much to ask and you are being shy asking for less money and then you know that your coworker uh, earns twice more, for example. And when you uh, ask, again, question why to your boss, for example, and they say, you just asked for less money. And it's not our interest to argue with you and propose more money because you were you were happy with it with this amount of money yeah yeah um, that's it for this research uh, i wanted to just share main points main interesting findings uh, about the data um, thank you very much <laughs> thank it you. was it was very interesting and and i think that this um around 30 percent uh, gender pay gap gap is, is very uh, similar to other countries in in the region uh, so so it's uh, in, in, it's interesting how much of it um, we can explain by different things but uh, but yeah I think one of the uh, one of the arguments has also been that uh, you know if more people would share their salaries or if it would be mm -hmm. more transparent and that would help also to reduce the gender pay gap but uh, but yeah i mean there are many many things uh, uh, which hopefully will change and then then it will be less so yeah, yeah i don't know does anybody have any uh, questions any like general or more specific questions at the moment or i can continue asking <laughs> so I, I, I was just wondering when you were showing the codes um, mm -hmm. that uh, you you mentioned that you had uh, you created some kind of columns also before. Uh, so I guess uh, I was just wondering what does the, the data structure looks look like um, in the beginning, and then how do you get to uh, the code that you showed us? Like what what are the steps in between there? Because uh, often the the data is. Uh -huh. um, it's really un unstructured or unorganized, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, yeah, uh, so I had uh, the table where maybe I can find it, or maybe it will take some time. Yeah, it was, um, um, for example, there was a table, like pivot table, and um, if I uh, worked with industries, for example, uh, there is a list of industries on those, and then there are two columns. Uh, men and women uh, so that's why it's pivot also uh, that could be uh, men and women and yearly dyna dynamics so you actually have two headers uh, above yeah and you have to split this table for men and women and it takes the last year because uh, uh, i also used dynamics um, for another uh, kind of question um, but for example for the first graph i, I didn't need it and that's why I had to split it and applied some for loops or something like that. Yeah, it is a very dirty data. And also, as I said, uh, there was uh, numbers, uh, weren't numbers in our format. So we have to clean it from commas, from uh, spaces, from, uh, you know, some tabs in uh, the, this table. Um, in a repo, there is a code and also files, so you can uh, explore it. Uh, for example, just open it and see what tables look like. Yeah. Okay, very good. So it's uh, it's uh, like all the steps are in the code in the, in mm -hmm. the Git, GitHub repo. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. It's possible to check it from there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just shared uh, the most interesting and useful functions uh, that I used, and then there were routine tasks like organizing data, selecting something, and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, this task, um, I think uh, when you want to learn more about R or other tool that you want, uh, that you use, you just take some public data. Uh, and they're always a mess. For example, uh, I, from our ladies' communities, I knew uh, 
that there is uh, this uh, uh, tidy Tuesday uh, stuff. And uh, for last, last week, I um, analyzed uh, astronauts' data. For the first time, I took a part in this uh, community, I guess. Uh, and it was also public data, and there were a lot of errors, and you're starting to you thought, yeah, okay, now it's fine. And then you start to analyze it and get another errors, like uh, some someone went to, uh, for example, uh, uh, went to the mission and stayed there for zero hours. And then you start learning from Wikipedia that, that there, were, there was a mission, but something was wrong uh, with uh, spaceship, or for example, there was a mission that uh, they went to and everybody died because something was wrong with shuttle. Uh, yeah, and this kind of uh, mistakes or uh, unexplained stuff is always in public data because in a job you mostly don't have this kind of issues because uh, either you have explanations for it, either it's okay. And uh, you use public data to learn new stuff to boost uh, the skills. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good idea, uh, and I think uh, I haven't checked it uh, now, but I think it's it's quite easily you can just uh, uh, yeah join it and and just do uh, select mm -hmm. some kind of a data and then do uh, something with it to to show your skills. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but did you also? Um, so this was for twenty nineteen. Now the the data. Mm -hmm. Did you also look back uh, for other years? Like how has it changed, or has it changed uh, over years? And how long uh, could you go yeah, back? Yeah, uh, I think I can open the article. Um, I uh, compared last five years statistics, and it was very sad. Um, somewhere here. Uh, so in five years, uh, I had dynamics only for 2017 because I didn't have data in dynamics uh, for more years. And I see that in 2017, uh, so average salary for women is less than average salary for men in 2013. It's not even equal, it's still less. Yeah, it was uh, a sad uh, part. Uh, so it's growing else. even, the difference. Yeah, mm. yeah it's uh, even a uh, uh, different uh, growth rate for men and women. And also we have uh, interesting effect uh, in, so we have this uh, peak of growth in 2016 that because we had evaluation of our currency, so it's not about progressive thinking or something like that. It's just about economy <laughs> situation. Yeah. And uh, do, can you do you also know what was driving this um, uh, this increasing difference? Uh, then what kind of a sector or or why why did it increase? Uh, um, I didn't analyze by region or sector, but I think it's just inflation because I compare it with inflation rates. Uh, and it's just growing according to inflation rates. So it's not um, a big difference, I guess. And also we have, uh, after 2015, we, have, we are having devaluation after devaluation. So every year uh, our currency is costing lower and lower. And that also takes impact. And also in some uh, organizations, they uh, they change your salary based on inflation rates. So we're not, you're not uh, like having uh, the same salary for four years long, for example. Yeah, that I understand. But I was just thinking uh, why the difference, uh, the, the mm. gap uh, increased. Was mm. it like larger in some sector or in some region? Do you uh, know? In some, in some region, uh, I had this plot. Uh, it's not in dynamics, but it's for regions. So we have uh, top five regions uh, with the highest gap. And uh, those two regions, Mangustau uh, and Adrao, those are oil regions. And I guess that uh, the gap is explained by the industry. So uh, those are some factories uh, 
and the job is hard to do and also the job means that you need to go somewhere far away for months or more than one month and usually in our country men do that but they uh, earn a lot of money from that uh, so that's how i explain because both of these regions so we have two regions and some and some that are that are working with oil and also uh you can see that there are even for women there are higher salary than in other regions because in general regions are rich because of oil again but still uh, women i think work, are working more in service kind of stuff they have uh, women working in uh, like great corporations, but I think they're less in number than men. And also in big cities uh, like uh, Almaty and Astana, the gap is lower. I guess maybe people are here are there are more aware of salaries. Maybe uh, there are more women working in uh, more I don't know, hard jobs or uh, taking uh, education stuff. I don't know. Also, there are more opportunities in big cities. You, uh, for example, I'm working as data analyst, and I can't imagine working in this kind of job at my own regional city. Uh, because I don't know if there are any positions, I'm not sure. Maybe there are, but there are maybe just two or three positions open. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Um, one general question. Uh, so does Kazakhstan have a strategy to fight the gender pay, pay gap? Oh, or it's not question. recognized as a major issue, do you know? <laughs> uh, I think it's recognized because I had, for example, when I'm doing this, uh, when I was doing this research, I found some uh, articles about gender gap and stuff. Uh, but it, um, but it's, I think it's not considered like uh, the major issue in Kazakhstan or something like that. It's not like on the agenda, <laughs> I guess. But um, I, I think there, there are people, teams uh, working on it. it. Because again, I found articles from Kazakhstan uh, sources about that. Okay. And also, yeah. And also this kind of uh, data that I got from statistic, uh, statistics uh, department, uh, the goal of it also was to analyze the gap uh, between men and women. And did you manage to uh, convince your friends? <laughs> Good question, no. <laughs> I showed those graphs about women asking less money and then they said, that's, uh, that's your answer, so ask for more money. <laughs> and somebody even said that, uh, if you are stupid, nobody will pay you more money. <laughs> it was just <laughs> out of there, yeah. yeah. I don't know what's, uh, what's the problem uh, with uh, maybe my friends or some people that I know. They just don't believe in this gap. Women believe in this gap, but men don't. I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess it's related to if you're not experiencing the problem, then, then you think mm -hmm. that the problem is not existing. Uh, Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because usually uh, also they say, for example, I have a friend who, were, who was hiring someone and just said, I never judge by gender or sex, I just, uh, I'm just hearing the salaries that they want and I just give it, if, if you can give it. Yeah. Uh, but it's not like only you hire people and only you is there. There are some other people <laughs> that are not so generous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so uh, about your own uh, background and experience, so now you are um, working in a company um, in Railsware, so you do mm -hmm. data analysis, an analysis there mostly? Um, I do uh, data, analyst, data analysis and also part of data engineering because we have a small team and we, we don't have a person with uh, like this role only, so he just manages data and uh, it's more like we have we have three data analysts now and each of us have uh, projects that he or she works on uh, for example uh, can be some different products that we work on some internal processes that we work on and 
it's our responsibility to organize data uh, related to this project and uh, to analyze it and to deliver some uh, I don't know, notifications, some reports, some dashboards. And stuff. Mm. Okay. So do you plan to uh, look at this uh, gender pay gap issue a bit further as well in the future to see how it has changed? Maybe, or... yeah. Maybe we can wait for like two or three years because uh, I don't feel that anything has changed mm. this year, especially in this kind of situation uh, that we experience because the, there isn't a question about pay gap, it's, there is a question about getting a job. <laughs> mm. A lot of people are now uh, unemployed, uh, asking for I hope say that uh, money from government, so this program to help uh, citizens. We have, for example, we have one uh, million one million inquiries from our population for this kind of money. Hmm. Yeah, and there are also probably some gender uh, differences in that who who is getting unemployed and in which region and area. But um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so does anybody have any other comments or questions? Like Anna said, yeah, this is a very complex and structural issue. So yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sure that it's possible to analyze it and, and should be analyzed further uh, with, with different, mm -hmm. uh, different methods. This is, I think, a very good um, basis for that. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, it, it uh, definitely needs uh, also a bit more analysis to understand where are the problems exactly. Yeah, I think there can be some deep research uh, for us uh, asking, talking actually to women because uh, the previous research about cruelty at home, uh, it was based, it, I think it was made by UN and it was based uh, on uh, quality interviews with, with those women or uh, survey. They actually were speaking to women and they were total methodology after, <laughs> after that, so you can trust it. With this data from uh, statistics department, I actually I'm not sure I can trust it, but still, it even it is showing uh, that there is a gap. Yeah, yeah, this is a very aggregate data, so so it's um, uh, hiding a lot of things, but but yeah, even that yeah. shows shows that there are differences already. So you you mentioned uh, yeah that you looked at also the gender violence. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe you can also mention a bit more. I understand that this is also uh, in the GitHub repo. You have code about that as yeah. well. Uh, yeah, uh, I have one. Um, if you, you can open the repo and I will show where it's stored. So I have this uh, women analysis report, uh, report and there is labor about salary, about wages and about violence. And uh, there is the data uh, from UN and there is the notebook and I can open the article, I guess. So to show main, main findings. Uh, I think uh, this research is more serious one because it's uh, it's about uh, being a danger uh, in your own home with your own relatives. Yeah, and that's why I started with this because it was more. I know for me it's more important because yeah, wages are important that you don't earn money if you need it, but this one is just uh, being a danger. Um, so I had this, uh, I even built some graph at Tableau, yeah, I think the link is in the end. So the main finding was that uh, it actually doesn't depend on your, uh, I don't know, uh, earning on your education, in, on your age, uh, where are you from, in general, you have, so we have people from different groups and even a small amount of them are experiencing such physical or psychological violence at home from people that they know. And uh, for example, for this graph, I see that uh, a younger women, uh, for example, here give get more frequent violence than the older one. I think maybe it's connected with uh, traditions, maybe, or maybe uh, women after a certain age get divorced finally with those kind of uh, men or maybe leave their home for a better life, life situation. 
also in education, I see that uh, women with uh, no high education, no uh, college education gets get more in trouble with this situation. And also, um, this chart is interesting that uh, I see that uh, if you are earn less than $300, you have uh, more this violence experience. And then here you don't have you have less women experience experiencing that and then when you get higher salary uh, you have more uh, this kind of experience it's it's weird maybe because it's aggregated and uh, there are some peaks and also there are less people uh, with this salary because it's above average uh, maybe it's just an anomalous on that um, also uh, yeah, uh, this uh, chart is weird uh, because it tells uh, how many people are in your family and when there is one person, I I think it's the woman herself, uh, but she still gets violence. Uh, it's, it's strange, so they're just her relatives coming and insulting, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So still, when you're home alone, you can still be uh, in danger. Uh, I, uh, this chart is about employment, so if you are employed or unemployed, you still uh, have issues. And actually, I see that when you are employed, you have um, more women experiencing this violence than uh, unemployed, but still uh, the difference is very low. And when you are speaking about where you live, so it's a city or town or village, in village you get, get more violence home than in the city. So uh, these numbers mean how uh, many women, what percentage of women uh, shared that they had so this kind of experience. Um, I also analyzed some uh, regions in Kazakhstan and, uh, based from uh, town and village, uh, how much differs uh, this uh, experience for women. For example, uh, in this region uh, is Karaganda. Um, in a village, they have twice more women, uh, eight, more than 8% of women, uh, compared to more than 4% of women in the city experiencing violence. Uh, same in Almaty uh, region and Akmala region. And also, there was some uh, interesting finding about. Uh, these two regions because they have more violence in cities than in uh, villages. And maybe it's connected that uh, uh, those regions are more uh, traditional or more, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe it's, it is related because I don't know uh, objective reasons why the situation can be different. Uh, so, uh, on average, we have uh, this region, for example, it's north of Kazakhstan, where uh, we have 38% uh, of women reporting uh, that they had some physical or sex violence uh, on, at least once in their lives. Um, yeah, so in this region, uh, I don't know why, uh, I'm not sure why this region is like leader of this rating, uh, maybe. It's, it's not a very rich region and also maybe when I discussed with my colleagues, maybe there are some problems with alcohol there or something like that. Uh, less stable social situation, maybe that's why, because it's uh, like very different from even the, the second place, uh, it's uh, East Kazakhstan. Um, what, uh, uh, and this number, uh, it was, uh, 2000 women said that uh, at least one in their lives uh, they experience physical or sexual uh, violence uh, from uh, their partner, not just any person, but from this partner. And uh, even this number is just very upsetting. It's, and it, when someone said that uh, feminism isn't, uh, isn't necessary in our country, something like that, but I think those. Uh, 2,000 women uh, won't agree with them. Because even there, if there are uh, 200 women, it's still an issue. Uh, but yeah. 
yeah that's also a very very interesting um insight and and i quickly had a look at the data and and it was interesting to see what they were asking about like what kind of violence so it was uh, mm -hmm. uh different kinds of violence and that's mm -hmm. uh you know uh, not only physical or sexual but also psychological so mm -hmm. so economical yeah yeah so so the numbers are much higher indeed um, who have experienced uh, different kinds of violence and not mm -hmm. only like once but but uh, several times in their lives mm -hmm. So it's very uh, worrying I, and I was just having one comment for the high paying um, part that why mm -hmm. people with higher income like that there are more people women experiencing violence um i mean I, I don't know exactly of course this is just one guess or hypothesis mm -hmm. that um um because that's also what we uh, often see like that the gender gap in in wages or also i think the unequal distribution of uh, home tasks um are more visible in these higher uh, either higher paying uh, couples or homes uh, mm -hmm. or positions uh, so it's it's like yeah there's sort of a, uh, a curve forming that it's uh, problematic in in very low earning uh, mm -hmm. people and also then it becomes problematic again in high earning uh, environments so so it's there is some kind of a pattern um, uh, mm -hmm. also in like based on other countries um, I think uh, so, but yeah, it's also worth uh, looking into that more. Yeah. So, does anybody have questions about this? It would be interesting to see more uh, more work like this also for uh, I don't know for Georgia and and for different countries. So. And if you should work more about it, then it would be interesting to hear about it again. So, yeah, I don't know if anybody is going to do something about Georgia, then maybe they could share about that yes, as well. Yeah, we can compare. Yeah, they can maybe turn to you if they have any questions about anything. Hello. I think mm -hmm. Hello, thanks for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. it and thanks uh, our ladies for inviting you. Um, I would uh, have a general question about data analysis, um, engineering and uh, data science. Um, I read that uh, most entry level professionals um, interested in getting into a data related job start off as data analysts. Um, it requires um, only bachelor's degree and good uh, statistical knowledge. Uh, what would you suggest beginners into this data world? Mm -hmm. um, okay, good question. I think uh, first about uh, you said about education. Uh, I mostly when I uh, applied for jobs, they didn't ask me about education. So I I have only bachelor degree but I didn't have issues with, with it when applying for jobs. Uh, the reason was uh, not enough skills, not enough experience when they reject, for example, me. And that's what they were looking for. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, I see what you're talking about. In some positions, they state that we need master degree in data science or we even need PhD, especially when they're in research uh, fields. Uh, and uh, about when, where you should start, I think, um, uh, maybe it's a good idea to start with data analysis, but if you're interested, personally interested more in data science, you can apply for uh, data science uh, junior position because they also exist and uh, because there are different types of jobs. Um, data scientists in general, they do uh, data analysis tasks, maybe because they don't have two different people for those two different jobs or things like that. Or, but still uh, they uh, solve different problems so you may uh, experience that you are applying for data analysts are working with data analysts and you can't shift to another field like data science because you don't have data science experience and, and again you will start with junior position so that's why i'm suggesting to just start with data science if you are more interested in that field mm -hmm. the same is with uh, data engineering uh, 
I um, personally, I don't think that data analysis is easier than data science. They are also they are both uh, have this uh, those pros and cons, and they can be both hard and easy to do. It's just two different fields uh, um, to perform to grow in. Yeah. Well, I understand. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for people who came to this meeting today. <laughs> yeah.